Welcome everyone. We'll be getting started in just a moment. As people are entering the virtual Zoom room, we welcome you and we'll be getting started uh, just once we see the group fully entered. Few more people are passing through those virtual doors. Great. So now that everyone's here, let's get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Rick Page. I'm Dean of the Lerner College of Medicine, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Randall Holcomb. Today, we're so glad you could join us for this, the third edition of Off the Charts, the periodic Zoom webinar series where we get to showcase important work going on at the Lartner College of Medicine. For those of you watching live, you will have a chance to be part of the, the discussion today. If you look on Zoom, there's a Q&A tool that you can address anytime during today's session. We will take these, these questions as well as those that have been posed to us uh, in advance, and um, I'll get to ask them of Dr. Holcomb. I'd like to especially welcome the many alumni from our college. The spirit of our alumni and your attachment to this place is truly special, and your support, your ongoing support of teaching, research, and clinical care allow us to provide for our students and everyone in our Larner community. Those missions, in addition to community service, will relate to my discussion today with Dr. Holcomb. Specifically, we're gonna talk about cancer care and research and what we've learned in the 50 years since the passage of the landmark National Cancer Act in 1971. We're also gonna hear about new treatments and approaches and what we can expect in the future. Before we begin, let me tell you a little bit more about our guest today, Dr. Randall Holcomb. In August of last year, Dr. Holcomb began his tenure as director of the UVM Cancer Center and chief of the Division of Hematology and Oncology in our Department of Medicine. Dr. Holcomb came to UVM with tremendous credentials and was a perfect person to fulfill both of these roles. He holds a BA from Duke University, my alma mater, and earned his medical degree from New Jersey Medical School. Later in his career, he also earned an MBA degree from the Zeckelin School of Business, part of the City University of New York system in Manhattan. Now, after medical school, Dr. Holcomb undertook clinical and research training at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He's held leadership roles in NCI-designated and non-NCI-designated cancer centers since 1989, including the University of California, the Tisch Cancer Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. And most recently, he came to us directly from his role as director of the University of Hawaii Cancer Center. In Hawaii, he led that institution through successful NCI redesignation and re renewal of the Cancer Center Support Grant in, in 2018. Under his leadership, that center expanded basic clinical and population-based research focused on the etiologies of cancer and on interventions to address cancer health disparities in the multi-ethnic populations of Hawaii and the Pacific. Dr. Holcomb has over 30 years of experience in translational research and the conduct of oncology clinical trials that, and has served as principal investigator for over 150 trials, as well as several NIH funded research project grants. Dr. Holcomb, Randy, welcome. Thank you. Th thank you for being here with us today. It's a real pleasure to be here, Rick. So before we get started, hearing about the latest developments and plans for the, the UVM Cancer Center. Let me get personal. How did you pick cancer as the focus of your career? I really didn't pick it on purpose from the beginning. 
I knew I wanted to go into medicine. I had a great exposure to scientific research uh, through one of my mentors um, while I was in college. And as I went through my training, I became really enamored with the immune system and how the immune system worked, how it affected disease and health. And I thought I could be an infectious disease doctor or perhaps a rheumatologist. But at the time, there was a growing sense that the immune system was involved in the prevention and development of cancer. And I enjoyed taking care of cancer patients. So that's how it happened. Fascinating. And, and I must say, during medical school, I never really appreciated the immunologic relationship to cancer. And really, as I, I imagine we'll be hearing from you, that's at the forefront today. It, it has exploded. And it has exploded because of the knowledge that we've gained, really, over the last several decades. So let's talk about that. It's been 50 years since the National Cancer Act. What have we learned in that time, just in a nutshell? We have learned so much over that period of time. In 1971, Nixon initiated his war on cancer. He signed the, uh, the National Cancer Act that initiated the cancer centers sponsored by the National Cancer Institute that are now across this country and also really put a huge amount of resources into cancer research. At the time, we thought that cancer was a disease, a single disease that occurred in different parts of the body. But we were wrong. Cancer is actually a thousand different diseases. It occurs in different parts of the body, but it's driven by different genetic abnormalities that can be different from one person to the next, even if we call it the same kind of cancer. A breast cancer, for instance, could be caused by several different types of mutations. We've learned so much over the last 50 years, we now know that cancer is much more complicated. But we've learned about the ways that the cell becomes cancerous, and that has enabled us to develop therapies to specifically target those abnormalities in the cell and treat cancer in a more targeted fashion as opposed to a broad, cell death, chemotherapy type fashion. So I think what we've learned is incredible. It's led to an explosion of new cancer medications that we can use for our patients, and it has improved survival. Nationally, the mortality from cancer has been falling over the last several decades. And that's a testament to both better screening and prevention, but also better treatments that have arisen because of cancer research over the last 50 years. Yeah, it's fascinating the genetics related, and even if you watch the news on uh, on the commercials, not only do are they advertising newer agents, but they I guess the FDA requires that they mention specific genotypes for which the cancer treatment might be appropriate. So it's getting out into the public domain, isn't it? It certainly is, and many drugs are just approved for a specific genetic uh, phenotype for a particular cancer. So you can't even use them for other cancers because they're not going to be effective. So it, it is a very complicated world now, but it's a better world because we're able to use more directed therapies, have better outcomes for patients, and improve cancer survivorship. Amazing. So we were so fortunate to recruit you to UVM. And, and even before you got here, I could see the wheels turning in your mind and of, of what the opportunities that, that we have here. Um, can you share with us your vision for uh, the UVM Cancer Center and how it relates to these advances that you've witnessed during your career? Really, we have four main areas of focus uh, for the Cancer Center here. One, of course, is research. We have some great researchers here at the University of Vermont that are already doing strong cancer research. We'd like to expand many of those programs. We particularly would like to expand our efforts in research in cancer immunology. This is that area that I was just talking about, which is so important from a clinical standpoint. Uh, we'd like to do some more work on uh, environmental exposures and how those interact with different genetic profiles to lead to the development of cancer. That's something that's very important, especially for us here in Vermont and at the University of Vermont, which is a land grant institution. So we should think about how our environment here may affect uh, how people 
our, how people's health and how they might develop cancer. So research is a primary focus that includes laboratory research, population-based research, as well as clinical trials. A second area of focus is exceptional clinical care. We have some wonderful physicians here at the University of Vermont and the University of Vermont Medical Center. And we want to ensure that we are bringing the latest and best treatments to patients here in Vermont and Northern New York. That's our mission. We want to continue to innovate because if we don't innovate, we're not going to make advances in cancer. One of the reasons we've made so many advances is because there've been clinical trials, there's been innovation over the last many decades, and we do much better in treating patients. Breast cancer, for example. We used to think of breast cancer as a single disease. Then we thought, oh, it's hormone responsive or not hormone responsive. Now we know that there are at least 20 different subtypes of breast cancer, and we have lots of targeted therapies available for uh, women with this disease and we're doing much better and have much better survival rates. So clinical care is another one of our areas of focus. Education is our third area of focus. We're at the University of Vermont. This is an educational institution, and we need to train the next generation of cancer doctors and the next generation of cancer researchers. And the Cancer Center is gonna play a role in doing that. And then our fourth area of focus is community outreach and engagement because there's really no reason to have an academic cancer center unless we serve the community where we are. And so we want to make sure that we reach out to the community, that we talk to community members about what their concerns are about cancer, and that we try to tailor our research programs and our clinical programs to make sure we meet those needs. So we are in a special place. This state, and you mentioned our partners, the UVM uh, Health Network, which includes upstate New York. And, and if you take Vermont itself, or you take Vermont plus, especially the, the North country of New York, you have a rural population, often a generationally poor and underserved population. How does that fit into your perspective in terms of the three missions for the, uh, for the cancer center plus community care as well? Well, it's very important. And a major area of focus for us are the disparities that are, exist between rural patients with cancer and urban patients with cancer. We know that rural patients actually do worse. They have worse outcomes. Part of that has to do with access to care, long travel distances, socioeconomic factors, uh, but there are probably many more um, uh, things that we could do to make sure that we bring the best therapy to those patients. One example would be clinical trials. A national study was recently done which looked at patients from rural communities compared to urban communities who enrolled on a National Cancer Institute sponsored clinical trial. And those people who enrolled on a clinical trial who were from rural areas did not have worse outcomes, which means that the exceptional care which we can provide on clinical trials of trials actually ameliorates the disparities between urban and rural populations. So one of our hopes here is to really expand our clinical trials effort and bring that out to the community and out to the rural areas across the UVM network. And I would imagine what we learn here could be applied in other parts of the country, other rural areas. I think of Wisconsin, where you've got Milwaukee and Madison in the South, but the, the top half, the northernmost parts of Wisconsin remind me of, of this part of the country. And do you envision the lessons that we learn here being propagated throughout? Absolutely. And we're an academic institution. So the things we do, we want to share with the medical community across the country. And the lessons we learn about how to bring better care to patients in rural areas we're going to share with everybody across the country because there are rural patients everywhere and we need to make sure that uh, we share best practices and we do better for them. Fantastic. Well, as we were first talking about this opportunity, I, I mentioned the Firestone Medical Research Building. Um, um, I, I think back to when we first got to talk, we didn't meet in person until you'd taken this job uh, because this was during, during COVID. And, and um, our interview and, and our first meetings were online, thanks to Zoom. 
Um, and um, during that time, we actually broke ground, although we took another year to have a groundbreaking, thanks to limitations of the pandemic, but we broke down, broke ground for the Firestone Medical Research Building. Can you comment on, on what your perspective was uh, when you first were hearing about that, what the opportunities are and, and what you see going forward in terms of our uh, celebrating occupancy in just a few months of this, of this uh, new building? Rick, you're correct. It was a leap of faith. I was in Hawaii. Uh, it, it's hard to travel back and forth during a pandemic uh, from Hawaii, quite honestly. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that there was an institutional commitment toward building the cancer program. And the Firestone building really exemplified that. I think that moving forward with building a research building in the middle of the pandemic was a bold move. And it was absolutely a factor uh, which prompted me uh, to accept your offer and to come here to the University of Vermont, which I'm very glad that I did. And the Firestone Building is gonna play a large role in this because it provides exceptional new research space. We're going to be recruiting new faculty, both in cancer and other areas that are gonna fill that building and do productive research that's going to eventually help the people in our community. And that's really what uh, Cancer Center is all about. And that's what we wanna do. The Firestone Building is gonna be a big part of that. That's wonderful. And, and we're all excited about about cancer care playing a, a, a major role in terms of the research conducted in this, in this new facility. So the, the Firestone Medical Research Building is, is still under construction and we're still working to raise funds for that as well as other, other uh, areas, cancer related and otherwise. Um, how does philanthropy fit with the, the future of cancer centers in general and, and ours here in Vermont? Well, I've talked about the four pillars for the cancer center, the areas where we have our major uh, focus. And we wanna build the cancer center in all of those areas. And honestly, we can't do it effectively without the assistance of philanthropy. As an example, the uh, J. Walter Juckett Foundation, which was previously known as the Lake Champlain Cancer Research uh, Organization, has been a strong supporter of the Cancer Center for many years, continues to be a strong supporter, which we're very grateful uh, for. And this has enabled us to recruit some new faculty, to build programs, both research programs, as well as clinical programs. We need that philanthropy because if we're going to embark on new initiatives, we need the funds to get those started. Just as an example, we hope to start a CAR-T or Chimeric Antigen Receptor T-cell program this coming fall. That's really a clinical and a research program because we'll be doing clinical trials, but many of the CAR-T products are actually FDA approved. We want to make sure that we have those available to patients here in Vermont and Northern New York so they don't have to travel to Boston and they don't have to travel to New York for those treatments. Whenever you initiate a new program, you have to recruit new faculty, uh, you have to use some funding to hire staff. So philanthropy always plays a huge role in helping to get new programs like this off the ground. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you and I have talked about this and, and, uh, and I love the name UVM Cancer Center. I would also love to see that associated with the name of a, of a generous donor who could make a transformative gift to, um, to the Cancer Center in terms of our partnership in terms of the, the college, the university, as well as the UVM Health Network. Uh, so we'll, you and I will keep that conversation going and look toward, toward that sometime in the future. I hope we can do that, Rick. I think uh, uh, a, a, a large gift is, can be, as you say, transformative uh, for a cancer center. I certainly experienced that when I was in New York uh, at Mount Sinai. And that is the famous Tisch family that, that's, that endowed that's, that? That's the Tisch family, that's correct. And uh, it made a huge difference in helping to build that program. We did not have NCI designation, National Cancer Institute designation, when I went to Mount Sinai and we worked to get it. We would not have been able to achieve it if we hadn't had the support from the Tisch family and other philanthropic uh, donors. 
So it, it's really essential uh, to do that. I think we can support our research programs better. We can support our community outreach better. And we can build new clinical programs. So all of those things are possible. Now, when as you were talking, and you reminded me of something that, that I've been really impressed by in, in your activities since you've been here and in talking with, uh, with others who are in the cancer world, and that has to do with collaboration. The, you've met more people around campus than I perhaps in different areas. And, and, and what, will you share with us what that means uh, I, I should mention that I'm tremendously proud that the Cancer Center is, is part of the Larner College of Medicine. And I had the privilege of, of, of working to recruit you along with strong input from the president and provost, as well as the leadership of the, the UVM Health Network and Medical Center, especially, as well as the medical group. But what does collaboration mean for cancer centers in general? And, and what do you see now that you're here in terms of opportunities for collaboration within this, this wonderful university? Great opportunities. A cancer center is all about collaboration and interdisciplinary research. It is not a silo. And a cancer center, and we have cancer center members from the Larner College of Medicine, from the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, from the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, we, from the College of Engineering. We have, we have members of our cancer center from all across campus. And I've been talking with leaders all across campus about new programs that we can uh, develop. We're working with the chemistry department, for instance, to hire a medicinal chemist who will support drug development for new drugs for cancer patients and support the researchers that are already here in the Larner College of Medicine in the redox biology program. So this is just an example of that, that sort of collaboration. I would also like to start a program looking at environmental carcinogens with the Rubenstein School and with the College of uh, Arts and Sciences, College of Nursing and Health Sciences and the Larner College of Medicine. This would be something that fits exceptionally well with our uh, history as a land grant uh, institution and something that I think is really an area of focus that we can bring a novel perspective and uh, find new answers uh, to how to prevent cancer uh, that may be caused by environmental exposure. So I think they're great opportunities. Collaboration is the way we're gonna do it. We won't do it as a silo. Um, and uh, we love being in the College of Medicine, uh, but we work with everybody across campus. Yeah, and, and that's, that's an expectation as we as we move toward NCI designation, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there is an expectation that that you have have collaboration throughout the institution, throughout the community, uh, and beyond, really in 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 service to uh, to the community. Absolutely true, and we're building the cancer center along those models uh, to really emphasize the collaboration with other schools and colleges, with the community, um, with other institutions as well, because you can't, you can't make progress um, in a vacuum. And the more people you have working on an individual problem, the more likely you're gonna find the solution. Yeah, nice. So we've talked about, um, about the opportunities here. And speaking of collaboration, given your, given your role in terms of this cancer center being UVM, but really uh, affiliated with the UVM uh, Health Network. We have three hospitals in New York. Uh, we have three hospitals in Vermont. And, and how do you see the, the value proposition in terms of the health network is clearly, I, I thought it was visionary that this was developed and uh, for all of our missions. How do you see the fact that we have this network and we have one tertiary academic medical center, but, but five other hospitals of varying size, how do you see that uh, playing into your plans in terms of say, for example, clinical care? I think, it, I think it's very important. I think the network is something that was very attractive to me. 
because we do want to address disparities in our different populations, in our rural populations. Uh, a lot of our network covers rural patients. So we want to make sure that we can bring the same quality of care that our exceptional faculty here uh, at, the, uh, at the University of Vermont in uh, Burlington to, to everybody across the network. We'd like to expand clinical trials uh, to those uh, areas as well. We already do that with uh, Central Vermont uh, Medical Center. We have many of our clinical trials are ongoing there as well. We'd like to expand that uh, next to the um, uh, CVPH over in uh, Plattsburgh. Uh, and we have uh, hopes that we can expand those even more broadly across the network. I think the other thing is that community outreach does not mean that we just reach out. It means that we reach out so that we hear what the community wants and what the community needs. And the network provides us a vehicle where we can get that input from the community across this broad area. Great. Well, this is fascinating. And I, I should mention that we have um, opportunity for those who are joining us uh, today to, uh, to pose questions for uh, Dr. Holcomb. Um, several have come through already. Um, uh, we're very fortunate off stage here to have Interim Chief Development Officer for Academic Health Sciences, Ginger Lubkowitz, who's been collecting these, uh, these questions. And uh, Ginger, why don't you uh, uh, provide uh, uh, the first question? Thank you, Rick. Um, we've received several questions related to being designated a National Cancer Institute Cancer Center. Um, we had this designation in the past. Um, is one of your goals to regain that is the question. So yes, the answer simply is yes, we're going to regain National Cancer Institute designation. I would not say that's the goal. The goal is to build the cancer center build all the aspects of the cancer center, the research, the clinical care, the education, and the community outreach and engagement so that we achieve the level required to get the NCI designation. So in the process of building the cancer center, we are going to get to a state where the National Cancer Institute will review us and will say, yes, you've made it, we can designate you as an NCI cancer center. We still have a little ways to go in all of those areas and we're working hard uh, to do that. Uh, as Rick asked, asked earlier about philanthropy, part of what we're gonna do is recruit new faculty, both clinical faculty as well as research faculty. And we use philanthropic dollars to help with some of those uh, recruitments. But uh, the ultimate, uh, uh, not I wouldn't say the goal, but the outcome uh, at the end of this journey uh, will be NCI designation. Yeah, and I love the way you put that. We, we owe this wonderful community and region a world-class cancer center. I'm proud of where we are now, but we have so much more we can do. And I think of, of NCI designation as just acknowledging that we're doing what we need to do for the community. I think we're excellent now. But to get NCI designation, we need to go up the next level to outstanding or exceptional. And we're going to achieve that. Great. Um, Ginger, next question. Okay, next question. What percent of patients are entered in clinical trials? How can that be increased? Clinical trials are very important. I'm passionate about clinical trials. I've been doing clinical trials for the last 30 or 35 years. And uh, it's the way that we make progress. Uh, in finding new treatments uh, for people with cancer. Children with cancer uh, across the country tend to go on clinical trials at least 75% of the time. So it's really the standard of care for kids with cancer to go on to a clinical trial. And that level of participation in clinical trials is one reason that we've made such exceptional advances in the treatment of kids with cancer. Adults, only about 5% across the country enroll onto clinical trials. And we do need to improve that. I think one of the things that we need to do is provide education about clinical trials. We're working on doing that. Um, uh, in fact, we, we've just had some uh, releases about the myths and truths uh, about uh, clinical trials. And I welcome you to 
go to our website at uh, vermontcancer.org to, to read about some of those. Because I think a lot of people have misconceptions about clinical trials. Clinical trials that we offer here never provide anything less than the standard of care. So everybody gets at least the standard of care and may get better. And this is something that we're committed to here and that we're going to be expanding, as I said, across our network. It's a, it's a major area of focus. Great. Senator. Hey, um, do you have insights into how to help patients be less traumatized by the term cancer? Well, I think cancer is a, is a traumatizing word. I think we've made great progress though over the last 50 years. Many more people are cured of cancer. It used to be we didn't cure anybody uh, from cancer, but many people are cured. The number of cancer survivors uh, is increasing exponentially every year. I think as we get better and better therapies and more therapies that are targeted, that are directed at a specific genetic abnormality or that harness a person's own immune system to help fight the cancer. These tend to be less toxic and less damaging than traditional chemotherapy. So the more we can use these newer therapies, I think the less traumatizing it will be for patients when they hear about the word cancer. But it's always a difficult diagnosis. I think we just need to educate people about the opportunities that are available and the opportunities for cure. And I think, you know, the, the putting together the word cancer with survivor more and more is, is, um, is going to help. And, and that's really what you all are accomplishing. Um, people are living with cancer and dying from something else these days. And just as in heart disease, my own specialty, our goal is to, uh, to provide a full and healthy life. So someone, we're all going to die someday, but dies from something else and not that, that specific, somewhat scary diagnosis. Right. Absolutely true. And the other thing is that we've developed new medications to help people through the journey and uh, to help decrease the toxicities of whatever treatments that we're giving. A lot of those have been developed because of clinical trials. And uh, those uh, supportive uh, care things like anti-nausea medicines have improved dramatically over the last several years. The other thing that I think is very interesting and that we'll be expanding here uh, at our cancer center uh, is the use of complementary medications and complementary approaches such as uh, integrative uh, oncology approaches, including things like acupuncture and Reiki and healing touch um, and meditation, things that can help people to receive the therapies without so much toxicity. And I think that's helping people a lot. Yeah, I, I, that's very exciting work and is, is expanding here at, at UVM. Ginger, what other questions do we have? What are the latest advancements in the treatment of ovarian cancer? Wow, so uh, ovarian cancer, uh, a ver very interesting disease. I think the, uh, one of the things that we've learned a lot about is that there's often a genetic predisposition uh, to ovarian cancer. Uh, it, it relates to the BRCA uh, genes, which can also lead to a predisposition for uh, breast cancer. Uh, people who have those sorts of abnormalities uh, can be treated with a targeted therapy. So that's one new uh, advance. Uh, we still use a lot of what we would think of as traditional chemotherapies uh, for ovarian cancer, but we use many more uh, immunologic therapies as well as antibodies that may block blood vessel formation, for example, uh, in tumors and can make chemotherapy more effective. So I think there are lots of advances in ovarian cancer. One of the areas where we haven't made great advances is in the screening for ovarian cancer. And this is an area uh, that I think is uh, a, an important topic uh, for future research. And what is the screening or is it? it There's it, not great screening. So, so, so that's the it, bottom line. The symptoms so, arise or I guess occasionally serendipitous scans might identify something, but beyond that? Well, you can do ovarian ultrasounds. Uh, those aren't necessarily recommended for the general population. They are recommended uh, for people with a familial predisposition uh, to ovarian cancer. But for the general population, 
there's not, uh, there's not a great screening test uh, for ovarian cancer at the moment. I would mention one other thing, and, and it's something that we're gonna have a panel discussion on at the uh, upcoming uh, Women's Health and Cancer uh, Conference, which is uh, coming up uh, in September um, here at UVM. And that's that people are trying to develop blood tests, which looks for genetic abnormalities and may have the potential for identifying cancers early on before anybody has any symptoms. Is this it's what they're talking about liquid biopsies? These are liquid biopsies, and these are liquid biopsies for the general population as opposed to liquid biopsies for people already with cancer. It's not ready for prime time yet. These are not FDA approved tests. Research is being done to see if we can utilize these. But that would make be a tremendous advance, especially for people living in rural areas. Yeah. If we had an easier way uh, to help screen people for cancer. Back to the ultrasound question is if if one is performing ultrasound in high risk individuals, if an abnormality is identified by ultrasound, is that soon enough in terms of the progression of the disease so that, that cure is possible? Yeah, usually, yes, it can be. Sometimes it's not, but, um, but uh, hopefully it'll be soon enough that uh, uh, surgery followed by some uh, form of systemic therapies, therapy that goes through the whole system uh, would be, um, uh, enough to put people into the cure category. Certainly it gets the jump on the disease as opposed to finding it months Ex or years later. Exactly. Whenever you find it earlier, it's always better. Makes sense. Ginger. Okay. With hundreds or more of cancers and thousands of treatments, how do you go about making sure that a specific client with cancer receives the correct 2022 diagnosis and 2022 treatment? So uh, this, this is the... Um, the difficulty for all oncology practitioners at the moment. It, it used to be in uh, a simple field in comparison, and now it is so complicated. And uh, the way that we can make sure that everybody gets the right diagnosis is to have people who are expert in various different fields. So what we've done uh, through the uh, UVM Health Network is that we have people here in Burlington who are subspecialists in oncology and hematology. For instance, I only see patients with GI cancers, cancers of the gastrointestinal tract, like colon cancer and rectal cancer and pancreatic cancer. I don't see anybody with breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Um, there are other people who do that and they are most expert in that disease and therefore can keep up with all the latest advances. Now in parts of our network, uh, we have generalist oncologists but we work very closely with those oncologists so that whenever there are questions about the treatment, they can be referred here or they can do a doctor-to-doctor uh, -doctor consultation so that we can talk with them about the, uh, the uh, various opportunities. We also sponsor something called Tumor Boards. At Tumor Boards, it's a conference. It's attended by medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, radiation oncologists, gastroenterologists, radiologists, pathologists, no cardiologist, Rick, sorry. Um, but these, uh, these tumor boards um, allow us to really discuss uh, individual cases and make sure that everybody's in agreement about what the best path forward is. And many of our health network colleagues participate in those tumor boards. So it's really a health network wide uh, uh, conference that we hold. Great. Along the line of cardio-oncology, may I go off script here and ask you about that? That's an area within cardiology that has grown. And, and I will share with you a recent experience where a, a, a close family friend who was being treated for one cancer, suddenly I was told that they'd found a cancer in the right atrium. And that didn't make sense. In, in medicine, you generally you you like one unifying diagnosis and there was no no definite relationship that turned out to be an ultrasound visualized clot related to a an iv catheter a central line catheter that happened to be in the right atrium so that was one one cancer that i was proud to know that was fixed by the cardiologist by thinning the blood in that case but the the field of cardio oncology um there aren't that many cardiac um, uh, tumors that that you deal with, or tell me if if that's incorrect. But 
but the treatment of cancer can sometimes have overlap in the world of the cardiologists. Absolutely true. For example, Herceptin, which we use for uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, has cardiac toxicities, and we need to monitor that closely. A lot of our chemotherapeutic agents affect the heart. Adramycin uh, used to be a one that was back in the day. Yeah, fortunately, we don't use that that much anymore. I'm, but I'm we, still use, we still use it some. <laughs> sure. Um, but uh, actually, when I was at uh, Mount Sinai, I helped to initiate an uh, oncocardiology program. Perhaps that's something we should talk about uh, trying to uh, initiate here as well. Um, I think that uh, working closely uh, be with the cardiologists and the oncologists is something that can really benefit uh, our patients and close, close follow-up. One of the things that's most important is to make sure that cardiology is involved in survivorship care for patients because a lot of these cardiac toxicities don't happen right away. They may happen five years later or 10 years mm -hmm. later. And so if there's not someone who's attuned to that, who's following a patient who's a cancer survivor, it might be missed. And so that's, uh, that's an area that, uh, that I think uh, is really a growth area and uh, something maybe we can look toward here. Great. Thanks for educating me on that. Ginger. Okay, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I wonder if you have more to say. Um, the question is, do you have plans to grow integrative health services in the Cancer Center for the Vermont and New York community, including research initiatives? Absolutely, yes. And uh, we are actively working um, uh, to find uh, support uh, for that. I think the easiest way to find support for integrative oncology uh, is through philanthropy. And it's very important. It's important to our patients. A lot of patients use complementary medications. Uh, and if we don't ask about it, they don't tell us because they're concerned we'll, we'll say they shouldn't. But uh, a lot of the time, uh, they, they are beneficial and they're not harmful to the treatments that we're giving uh, to patients. So we are expanding uh, integrative oncology here. Uh, in fact, with the Victoria Buffum Fund, uh, we are able to initiate an inpatient acupuncture program. And that's gonna be initiated this fall. And that's a philanthropic um, driven uh, program. And this is going to be for cancer patients who are admitted to the hospital to try to decrease anxiety and decrease pain, uh, which, is, which are both uh, common problems for people who are admitted uh, to the hospital. And we're really excited about, uh, about initiating that program. As we talked about earlier about collaboration, this is a collaboration between the College of Nursing and Health Sciences and the Larner College of Medicine perfect. that we're gonna be able to implement this program. That's perfect. Ginger. Okay, next question. Can you offer examples of current community outreach and engagement? Well, we have lots of educational uh, opportunities that we, uh, we provide uh, for the uh, community. I mentioned the Women's Health and Cancer uh, Conference, uh, which is coming up on, um, on September uh, 30th. Uh, we participate in health fairs uh, across the uh, community, um, uh, which, which is, is very important. Uh, we, uh, we are working uh, to expand our uh, screening uh, across the state and across Northern New York. We are collaborating with uh, the Dartmouth uh, Cancer Center on a lung cancer screening initiative. That's also being done with the um, Department of Health and Vermonters Taking Action Against Cancer uh, Organization. So that's something that we're, we're directly involved with in trying to improve the rate of lung cancer screening, especially for people who are smokers which uh, is more common in our rural communities. So it's essential to help uh, reduce the disparities uh, across our state. Now, if I'm, I'm, I'm remembering correctly, there is significant risk for melanoma here in the state of Vermont. We, we do get sun exposure. And was there a screening operation that, that was held recently on site? I think we have talking about the Firestone building. Yes. Yeah, so, um, there, there are actually lots of screenings that we do uh, related to melanoma. We collaborate with the dermatology uh, division within the uh, Department of Medicine on many of those. We also um, know that our construction workers who are working on the Firestone building are exposed to a huge amount of sun. And so uh, the Cancer Center held uh, an event um, uh, at lunchtime. It was one of their safety meetings. And uh, we talked to them about um, 
uh, skin cancer prevention. Uh, we handed out uh, SPF 50 sunscreen to everybody. Um, also gave them some popsicles. It was a hot day. So uh, it, was, it was a great event. And that's, that's another example of some of the, that's what I'd call local community yeah. uh, outreach because it was essentially just downstairs from my office. Um, but uh, but that's okay. We have to reach everybody in the community. Yeah, I I love seeing a picture of that and just thinking of those those workmen who who I've very closely watched through all types of weather. I don't think they ever missed a day. They uh, they um, and and there were times when I might screen for hypothermia during the the construction. But I thought it was wonderful that the fact that there they are on our campus building a research building, and here are we are helping them reduce their chance of cancer on the job site. I thought that was a brilliant combination of all sorts of different positive factors that well, we have I, around I'm, here. I'm going to give the uh, kudos to our Director of Communications and Community Outreach, uh, Kate Strautmeyer. Uh, it was her idea and uh, we ran with it and I, I think they appreciated it. Brilliant, brilliant. Other questions that we have from the audience? Another question we have is what's new in breast cancer research and treatment? I think I've talked about that a little bit. Uh, breast cancer uh, is um, a, a disease where most women uh, we can cure. And uh, we've learned a lot. And one of the things that we're working on now is how to reduce the amount of treatment that we give to people, but still maintain those excellent results uh, in, in curing a large proportion of women with breast cancer. The One of the things in medicine is that we tend to think that more is always better. Give people more of this, more of this, a new drug, a new medication, add on extra things. But we know that cancer treatments have side effects and sometimes they have long-term side effects as we talked about with, uh, with Herceptin, Herceptin and cardiology um, related uh, side effects. So now we're looking at how we can reduce the amount of treatment and actually still maintain a, a high rate of cure. This is something that's been done in pediatrics now for many years because we made great progress in kids with cancer. But when kids have long-term side effects, they got a lot of years ahead of them and you don't really want them to have long-term side effects. So the effort to, to reduce to the minimal amount of treatment that's needed uh, has been going on in pediatric oncology for a long time. And we're now moving that into the adult uh, treatment realm as well. Yeah, and along that line, uh, you're talking about the, the chemotherapy and perhaps radiation therapy. I think back to my clinical clerkship in surgery when I when I scrubbed in on a radical mastectomy, for example. And the the at that time, the thought was more surgery was better in terms of of treatment. And now, can you comment on how things have moved from the era of Halstead to the the current? Um, surgical procedures that complement, uh, but rather than dominate the treatment in terms of chemotherapy or perhaps radiation? So a Halstead uh, radical mastectomy is not done anymore, period. Uh, and most women can get a lumpectomy and they can get some uh, uh, post-surgery uh, radiation and chemotherapy uh, and have better results. Uh, I'm going to give an example of a clinical trial that we're doing in a different disease, rectal cancer. Rectal cancer is a very tough surgery. People end up with ostomies. Nobody likes to have an ostomy. Um, uh, and we have a clinical trial going on right now where we're looking at giving chemotherapy and radiation therapy, seeing if we can achieve a complete response. And for those people who achieve a complete response, we're monitoring them extremely closely and seeing if we can avoid surgery altogether. No surgery at all. No surgery at all. So this is a clinical trial. It's not yet standard of care but it's a clinical trial that we're doing here. We're doing it in conjunction um, with uh, uh, Washington University uh, in St. Louis. And it, it's, a, it's a great program. Patients have been signing up for it because if there's an opportunity that they may be able to get uh, no surgery, um, they wanna take it. And so this is just an example of, of new things that we're offering here that I think will be the standard of care in five years. That's phenomenal. Are there any other questions from the audience? We do have more questions. Um, here's one. What are the best and worst rates of correct diagnosis and treatment for various cancers? Um, correct diagnosis, including time to correct diagnosis, as well as level of detail. 
So uh, what I would say is this, we almost always try to make the right diagnosis. Um, th there are a few occasions, it's really rare nowadays where you can't make the right diagnosis about what kind of cancer people have. Because when we get a biopsy now, we do not just look at it under the uh, microscope and say, oh, it looks like it might be this or it might be that. Um, that's what you know we did 25 years ago. Now the pathologists will look at it. They will do special stains. They will do uh, special analysis on the, on the tissue. We also do th something called flow cytometry where we may be looking at the lymphoid panel um, uh, that may be involved in, in a certain tumor. We do lots of genetic testing. So we can send off tumor samples or even do here uh, genetic testing with uh, something called next generation sequencing to try to look for the particular genetic abnormalities. And they are often pathognomonic of a particular type of cancer. So I think it's pretty rare nowadays where we can't make the right diagnosis. And if we make the right diagnosis, then uh, we have the opportunity, of course, to give the right treatment. So I, I think nowadays it's, it's much better than it used to be. Very rarely do we have something called cancer of unknown primary. This is actually has a designation because it happens so often. Um, doesn't happen so much uh, anymore. Now we, we pretty much can usually localize things. I can't tell you 100% of the time, but uh, well into the high 90s. Right. Thank you. We have um, one last question. What's the biggest challenge facing the Cancer Center? Well, we have a lot of things going on. Uh, we want to build our research program. We want to enhance education. We want to do more and more community outreach. It's critically important uh, uh, to us. And all the while, uh, provide exceptional uh, patient care. So there are lots of moving parts. And um, I think I'm going to go back to a question which was uh, asked by Rick uh, earlier about how philanthropy helps us. Philanthropy definitely helps us build all of these programs. We want to build this into an exceptional cancer center. It's one that uh, we will then uh, be recognized by the National Cancer Institute uh, and uh, receive their designation as an NCI designated uh, center. Uh, I think the biggest challenge is just that we have all these things going on at the same time because quite honestly, I'm a bit impatient and uh, I want this uh, to happen over the next three to four years. Um, and I want us to get to that level over that period of time. And I don't wanna uh, have it go any longer than that. So, um, so I think that's probably the biggest challenge at the moment. Right, but not insurmountable. Absolutely not insurmountable. Well, Randy, this has really been a pleasure. Um, you and I have known each other maybe going on close to a year and a half now. And, and I've learned a lot about cancer from you. And, and early on, um, before we met, it became clear to me that, that we need, we, we owe this university, our community, our region, a designated, NCI designated cancer center. And again, for the very reason that you said, not because of name, don't get me wrong, we want that name, but because of what that name entails. And that is a, a level of excellence in providing clinical care, research, education, community service. Our, our region deserves that. And soon after we met, it was clear to me and many others that you were the perfect person for this role and that you will be the person who leads us to that designation. So it, it's really a pleasure to visit with you. And, and again, I, I learn every time we talk. Um, for those of you watching live or, or afterwards on, on video, I really wanna thank you for joining us for this, our third, um, uh, edition of Off the Charts, a periodic Zoom meeting where we get to talk about exciting things going on here at the Larner College of Medicine. I should mention that that uh, when we close, there will be a web address for you to, um, to access the website for Off the Charts for today's edition, for previous editions, um, uh, for your interest, and also um, encourage you to get in touch if you have further questions. Uh, there's so much exciting going on here. And uh, um, this is a uh, fun for me. I hope it's a, a fun and, and, and educational for those who are getting to join us today. So Randy, Dr. Holcomb, thank you so much for joining us. 
uh, today. Thank you so much for your leadership and, and the great things that we already see happening and those happening going forward. And, and for those of you joining us today, thank you for joining us. Stay well, stay healthy. I can't wait to see those alumni and other friends here back in person uh, before long. Have a great day.